Joining us now is Dr. John Abramson. He's been a guest on the show before, and he's got a great book. Let's put it up there on the screen. Sickening, How Big Pharma Broke American Healthcare and How We Can Repair It. So, Dr. Abramson, really appreciate you joining us again. Uh, one of the things that I touched on in my monologue today was longevity data about how many deep underlying issues there are in American healthcare. Just as a doctor, as somebody who studied this in the pharmaceutical angle as well, just expound on that for us. What does this longevity data and the decline in U.S. US life expectancy so precipitously. Tell us about our population. What it tells us is that our health care is very fragile and that uh, the COVID epidemic pandemic has stressed our health care, but the decrease in longevity for Americans over the past couple of years is not entirely due to COVID at all. It's largely due to the weakness, not the greatness, of our health care system. Um, get into that a little bit. As you're looking at that data, uh, obviously COVID took an enormous toll on the population, and that's, as you're indicating, part of what's reflected here. But these trends of lowering life expectancy predate the COVID pandemic. So at core, what are some of the other more uh, sort of fundamental issues that you're seeing in this data? Right. So let me just go back and frame the problem. In 2019, before the pandemic ever started, Americans live 3.3 years less than the citizens in 18 other wealthy countries. 3.3 years less. Wow. By the end of 2021, we lived 5.3 years less. So the COVID pandemic has had a, a much greater negative effect on Americans' overall health in, uh, than it has uh, for citizens of the other countries. Yeah. And so, John, one of the reasons that we originally wanted to talk to you was, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, there's been a lot talked about on the climate change piece, on the financial piece we've covered here. But there was a Medicare part to this as well, which was supposed to address pharmaceutical companies, uh, bargaining and more. Talk to us about whether any of the provisions in that bill are going to help the problem or not. Well, let's talk about each of the provisions. The one that got the most press was the right for Medicare to negotiate drug prices. Uh, and uh, that would be a real good idea, and it would be a good idea to negotiate drug prices when drugs come out and um, we find out how effective they really are compared to the previously available drugs. But the negotiation package in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act is not going to get the job done. It allows for negotiation of 10 drugs initially, and then that goes up to 20 drugs, Medicare drugs, that are the highest spend drugs. But the the, the trick in this is that the drugs that are available for negotiation have to have been on the market for nine years for conventional drugs and 13 years for biological drugs and not have a generic version coming within the next two years. So it means that very few drugs that are still on patent are going to be available for negotiation. Now, what this, in countries like France and Germany and Canada, they negotiate the price of drugs on the front end uh, based on the effectiveness of the drugs. But we have no mechanism for determining the effectiveness of new drugs compared to other drugs. Um, and we let drug companies charge whatever they want. In the other countries, they can't charge whatever they want. So we have this enormously high-priced brand name drug business in the United States. And this bill is just gonna clip just a tiny bit off of the tail of that uh, hyper profitable uh, business. And I mean, do you attribute that to the fact that it's, I mean, these companies are very large, they're very profitable, money is very important in our system of politics. Is that why we end up with such a worse system and with these bare incremental, like bare, <laughs> like tiny little changes that are sold as a big transformative package? Is that why we end up with such inadequate results? That's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's clearly a demonstration of the power of the pharmaceutical industry. But one of the problems, one of the reasons why we end up with this is uh, beyond uh, pharmaceutical lobbying and campaign contributions and all, is that it's so complicated that the people, ordinary people and doctors can't understand it. They can't understand that the United States is the only country that doesn't have health technology assessment. So docs don't know which new drugs are truly superior. And we're the only country that allows uh, drug companies to charge whatever they want. So two thirds of the profits from the drug, global profits from the drug companies 
now come from the United States. And this system not only pulls money away from Americans, either out of their pockets or through their tax, tax dollars, but it allows the drug companies to promote drugs that are no more effective than older therapies <laughs> as if they were. So wow. it's distracting our healthcare. And uh, uh, this is the biggest reason why American healthcare doesn't uh, perform as well as the other wealthy countries. That it's the knowledge that doctors have about the new drugs and their rightful place in therapy that's the problem. And this uh, drug negotiation package, which pharma is uh, crying like a squeal, squ squealing like a stuck pig about, um, that it's going to chill innovation and uh, the pharma industry won't be able to function. It's just complete hyper. It, it's nonsense. It doesn't. It, it's nonsense. This this plan. Out of 1,300 new drugs that will be approved over the next 30 years, this plan is going to decrease the number of new drugs by 15. Hmm. 15 wow. drugs. And wow. only one out of four of those 15 drugs is actually superior. Wow. So there's not, there's not a chill on innovation. It's a scare tactic. Let me ask you about um, an idea that is being experimented with in California, which I actually talked about in my monologue a little bit, which is they said, all right, these drug companies want to price gouge consumers on insulin. Obviously, this is a critical, uh, essential medicine for lots and lots of people. We're just going to invest $100 million in making our own insulin, creating sort of like a public option uh, for this critical drug. We're going to sell it more or less at cost. If they want to compete with that, good to go. But we're going to make sure our the citizens of our state have access at an affordable price to insulin, which costs very little to produce. But uh, the numbers I saw, an average a vial of insulin in the U.S. costs like $98. The average in every other country around the world is like $8 a vial. What do you think of that sort of direction of like direct federal government uh, intervention into the market? Yeah, or state government intervention. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think it's brilliant. Michigan is doing the same thing. So the insulin analogs, which can cost up to $300 a vial, um, uh, can be made uh, by nonprofits for $35 a vial. The key fact here that's being covered up it, by the Inflation Reduction Act is that um, limiting insulin copays to $35 is going to be a good thing for insured folks who require insulin who don't have enough money to pay their copays. That's a good thing. But the bad thing is that as the California project comes on online or the Michigan project comes online and makes $35 insulin, $35 analog insulin, what's going to happen is the drug companies, the brand name drugs are going to say, hey, don't let your doctor shift you down to an inferior generic product when you're doing well on the brand name insulin. Stay with us because it's only cost, going to cost you a $35 copay. So what's going to happen is that that $35 limit to the copay is going to um, largely neutralize the market benefits of California mm. or Michigan uh, selling uh, insulin analogs at cost. And the real issue underlying this that nobody talks about, because I've got a chapter on this in my book, is that 80% of the insulin that's used in the United States is used by people with type 2 diabetes. And there is no evidence that the insulin analogs that cost $300 a vial are superior than the first generation of bioengineered insulin, uh, recombinant human insulin, which does cost $35, $25 a vial uh, when it's bought uh, efficiently. Um, and the docs have been convinced through the drug company marketing that they should be prescribing the insulin analogs to their patients with type 2 diabetes. 90% of patients with type 2 diabetes use the insulin analogs when there's no need for that. And I believe that this $35 copay is really a plan to continue to cover up that fact that mm. the doctors have been misled to prescribe the expensive insulin when the far less expensive, ex mm. expensive insulin would do uh, just as well for their patients. Well, this is why we so appreciate your expertise. Uh, I, I'll remind people, if you haven't gone back and listened, Dr. Abramson's appearance on Joe Rogan is an absolute must listen. You have such deep knowledge of the system, and we're going to keep coming back to you, sir. So thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. It's our pleasure.
Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, as we said, we're going to announce it after, but uh, preempted by the media, so be it. <laughs> Apparently, they care so much about breaking points. Ryan Grimm and Emily Jashinsky. We have that graphic. Let's throw it in the back there on the screen. Counterpoints, Friday, every Friday. Oh, beautiful. I love it. So nice. That's what it's going to look like. Every Friday, you guys are going to have a big, long, full show. We have fully told them, you guys do whatever you want. Your format, your uh, what, whatever stories you want to cover, that's how it is here at Breaking Points. That's how it works with every single one They're only of our partners. They're not allowed to be mean to us. Yes, they're not. Well, actually, they can be mean to me. I, I don't, you know. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I'm more of a masochist. I, my feelings are too yeah. fragile. <laughs> so uh, it's going to be amazing uh, for the people who are uh, premium subscribers. It is purely because of you that we are able to do this. We cannot thank you enough. Uh, for everybody who watches the show, listens to the show, podcasts, etc., all of you have done your small part in making it and enabling us to do this. When we set out, all we wanted to do was pay our bills. That's it. We were <laughs> like, just play the bills. Yeah, it's just got to pay. Keep the lights on here in the studio. But you showed up for us in such a big way. We could not just pay our bills. We could pay other people's bills. We could uh, hire other folks. We could pay even more bills. And that's just what we're going to keep doing. So look, we're just going to keep scaling things up. It's very, very expensive to do this. So if you uh, mind signing up as a premium subscriber, if you have that ability, I know the economy is tough, but if you have that ability, if you believe in this mission, we deeply, deeply appreciate it. Uh, we can't thank you enough. And we want everybody to know uh, that we won't be here for Labor Day, but we will be back. So happy Labor Day yeah. uh, to all those who are, all of those who celebrate, which should be <laughs> all of us, uh, especially yes. to those in organized labor of who we yes. stand with every day here yes. on the show. Um, that's it. What do you have to say, Chris? Yeah, I just want to say um, it is a big deal for us to add a show. We didn't set out it, to do this, We didn't. Crystal. We didn't Never set did. out to do yeah. it. Um, you know, they uh, came to us with the idea mm -hmm. and were excited about it. And, um, you know, we really thought about it and what it would mean for for you guys and for our expansion and felt like it was a, a wonderful fit, especially right now to build out during the midterms and, you know, have a, a product that's available to you almost every day now. So, um, yeah, we're we're really excited. We're really proud to yes. be able to do this. And we're so grateful that you have enabled it. So love you guys. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend, hopefully a long weekend for you. And we'll see you back here next week. See you next week. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.